This is the Misdirected Mark Podcast, a podcast about gaming, game mastering, and entertaining you, our listeners. We are explicit, and you have been warned, and I'd like to thank Mike Willard for letting us use his music on our show. Now let's pick up those mics and get on with this thing. Yes, let us pick up those mics and get down with this thing. And on this episode, we're going to talk about things that nobody cares. One of the things that nobody wears. You call them my name, but gotta make it clear. I can't say, baby, where I'll be in a year. Uh, uh, Chris, Chris, what? Chris, Chris, what are you doing here? What's going on with this? Well, you know. Because Bob's not paying attention to the copy, and this is the 261st episode of the Mr. Director Mark podcast, we're going to be talking about sweet immersion. What it is, how do you get it, and how do you keep it? But first, my name is Chris. My name is Phil. And I'm Old Man Logan. Who can't recopy because he's busy doing other things. Uh, Well, the crowd in the thing was saying that they weren't seeing anything, so I was about to type to them. Uh, Can we... um... Can we just go ahead and acknowledge something right now? There's some there's some audio issues going on with us. Yeah, our board might be falling apart. Yeah, we um, for our faithful podcast listeners and our audio files, we're going to apologize right now. Uh, we're getting some popping and cracking on uh, on our voices when we're talking. Uh, we've been trying to track it down for like 20 minutes, um, and we didn't find it, and we needed to get the show going. Uh, so we're hopefully. In post, we'll try to filter some of it out, but if you hear it, uh, we are well aware of it. It's driving us crazy, um, and we'll be troubleshooting it, and if not, getting a new board uh, fairly soon. Angela says that we sound fine. Well, if we sound fine to Angela, if the only thing is I'm hearing it all night, I'll suffer. For you know, I would prefer us to not have the problem. I, I would, would, I nice, would as well. Yeah. I'm also getting a weird video artifact where it keeps flashing at me. So That's bizarre. Yeah. I wonder why that is. Anyway, so hey, um, I'm gonna do this thing where I turn off the uh, my stream, like my my chat room, so I can't see yeah. the chat room anymore. Everybody, sorry. Okay, so anyway, hi, I'm Phil. Um, you're Chris. That's old man Logan. Yeah, we already yeah. did that. So Phil, yep. buddy, old pal, what's going on? Uh yeah. So I uh, this was actually a pretty good week. Did some stuff. Uh, first of all, I finished the Beast. Uh, that was really good. The Diana Jones nominated. Uh, Beast. Yeah. yeah, there's been some other Diana Jones uh, nominated folks. Uh, Emily Carabas. Emily Carabas for the romance trilogy. Yep, I got a chance to congratulate her on Twitter today. As mm. soon as because I was I was just getting ready to go to lunch, and then the Diana Jones people were live, t- like they were tweeting it out in a series of them. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, I think I'll just wait before I go to lunch, and I was just like <laughs> watching them go by. Yeah, it's pretty cool actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, so I finished the Beast. It was really good. Uh, the ending for my story, um, turned out to be super dark. Uh, I, I can, since no one's ever going to read the story, I can go ahead and tell, um, the high level version of it. But, um, at the end, uh, the beast, uh, dies and I come to find out, or I, I come to realize that, um, I can no longer be among people. And uh, so it ends with me taking a handful of antidepressants and a bottle of rum and wow. killing myself. Interesting. That's pretty dark. Yeah, it's a pretty dark story. Um, I was a little, like, I had some bleed after the, um, after I wrote the last section. So I, like, finished up the last section. And then I was just kind of like, okay. Like, I just sat there like, wow, I didn't really expect uh, the ending to hit me quite as hard, but anyway, it was really good. And I'm really happy I played it. And I know that, um, other people have had their challenges in, um, in playing it and finishing it. Um, but I'm really happy. Um, I got a chance to do it. It also happened to, um, influence me because on Friday I wrote a game. You did. So, so Blake Ryan, um, our friend of the show, uh, sent me this email and he sent me this like really high level, like light PBTA um, game, like just like something he threw together in an email uh, called Whirlwind Millionaire. And uh, it was the idea like your life changes when you, you know, when you win the lottery. And he had just like, a, you know, like a bunch of tables with dice roll kind of things like PBTA style. And I was like, yeah, now you got to remember Blake's in Australia. Correct. So by the time I get the email. Blake's off to bed and I'm like waking up. So I'm like, 
oh yeah, you could do like, you could do this. And like, I was just thinking about the beast. I'm like, you could answer these questions and you could like, and, um, you know, when you get that design spark, yes. Like when you fall <laughs> into the rabbit hole. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So Friday, I just chased the rabbit all day. Like I couldn't leave it alone. And I just, um, I knocked out, I think it's what about 2000 words. I think is what I saw the count on. And, um, it's called Whirlwind Millionaire, and I put it out for playtesting, and uh, we're going to make a thing out of it. I already made a card for the card backs for or the card template yeah. for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I finished it, and I – so I finished it, and I sent it to um, – I, I finished it, and I sent it to Chris and Senda, and I was like, uh, is this – is am I crazy? Like, did I just, like – did I just, you know, like have like a minor stroke or something in nope. the office? I edited it and it looked good. And I touched up some of the things here and there. And then Bob went in and cleaned it up. And I'm sure Senda said some things about it. Yeah. Um, well, there were a couple of things I knocked out design wise. Um, initially, I had a thing where you could refuse a card and you just paid a cost for it. No. But I was like, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> yeah, Senda was, that's what Senda said. She's like, no. And I was like, no. <laughs> like, and that was gone. But anyway, um, and then Bob got a hold of it. And uh, did some more magic on it. And so uh, we got it up to PDF playtest level. And uh, I put a thing out on the G plus community. People um, responded. And so I sent it out to a couple people. They're going to try it out. We're going to find out their stories of, uh, of what happens, the triumphs and tragedies of um, suddenly w winning millions of dollars. Yes. Yes. So I did that. Um, I played some Minecraft. Uh, I played some, I played some masks. Bob's going to talk about that. Hmm. Um, and I worked some more on hydro hackers. I, um, I finished the chapter on what it means to be a hydro hacker and I finished my very ugly, um, Photoshop map of the great Lake sprawl of which now I just want to go hire Mark Richardson to make me, um, a, a, a pretty one. Uh, but hold, I, but hold I, on there, boy, we'll get some money for that. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll get some real money for that. Yeah. I, I, well, that's the thing. I know how much it costs and we just, we need to, we yeah. need to make some money first. Um, when we are, when we are closer to kickstarting that game, yeah. we'll take some encoded money and we'll buy a map. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that so, we can have it in the Kickstarter. Right. The crude map was, but the crude map was enough for me so that, um, I came to understand that the Great Lakes region has like a couple different areas. And, and so now that became the outline for the chapter I'm going to write. Mm-hmm. Um, including uh, Gary Wood, where um, Gary, Indiana, which if you've ever driven through Gary, Indiana, um, it was the inspiration for the world of darkness, hmm. um, becomes Hollywood. Because California is, you know, a desert wasteland now. So um, that's prime real estate, cheap prime real estate cheap, right on the lake. Yeah. Cheap prime real estate. Yeah. There so it go. becomes Gary land. Anyway, um, so I did that stuff. Uh, hey, Bob. Bob, you also played in that masks game, and I, I did. did. I didn't talk about it because I figured you should talk about yeah, it. Yeah, we played masks, and my character met his doom. Yeah, he died. Yeah, he like did. totally. <laughs> well, he did. first he went bad. First I broke bad, and <laughs> then, um, for 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 the abridged version, uh, I was helping fight the bad guy from inside, in the in the head inside space, inside your thing, head inside yeah. my head, um, and with a little help from Nikki's character Willow, uh, the two of us helped keep the bad guy distracted long enough for the guys on the outside to finally take him down and oh. separate me from the bad guy because we kind of merged together. I got kind of busted up in that fight. Yeah, you get busted. I got up. Put, I, not as much as I could have. I I rolled well enough that I kept avoiding. Shots from it, but he did, oh, which is man. probably good because he, when the first time he hit you, he sent you, you know, up into the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. Pretty, he was a hard hitter. Hard um, so yeah, but yeah, so the the um, the the crazy part is now that Bob's character is dead, um, both Nikki and I have to like deal with the fallout of this, and yep. we've both taken um, completely different tacks. So, um, Willow is mad at the adult superheroes for not saving Bob sooner. And I am like, yeah, we were wrong. Like we were in over our heads. We need the adults help. Yep. <laughs> um, and so the team's like a mess right now because we were only three of us and Bob pulled a Thunderbird for you X-Men fans. Uh, Bob pulled a Thunderbird and now we're down a team member. Um, we're going to have a new guy because yep. Bob's going to bring in a new character. Um, although this would be the ideal time to get a fourth player as well. It would. I mean... Um, 
if we wanted to add a fourth player, we should do that. I'm okay with that. Well, now would be the time. Like, the team's a mess. Yeah. So, um, so we should recruit. But Yeah, we should talk about yeah. that. But anyway, so Nikki and I have both agreed that um, there needs to be one more issue of us dealing with the fallout yep. of uh, Morph's death. The talky-talky feelings issue. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's just going to be some yelling. There's yeah. going to be... Because Willow is certainly not going to be happy when she finds out that um, Solar went Solar went to the elemental form and was like, no, no, like <laughs> we, we need, need your help. help. We're a uh-huh. mess. We're in over our heads. Which is good. Um, I think we talked a little bit about the table. I think it'll be actually fun for Nikki and I to actually... Um, play through some of that but yeah we all have to kind of now get over morphs passing yep so I that have, was masks i have interesting things to say about that game so i'm very comfortable playing with two of you and i've played plenty of one shots with nikki but i've never played in a long longer term game with nikki before and she doesn't play the same in a, in a short term in a longer term game as she does in a, in a one shot and getting getting used to that has been uh tricky actually and uh adjusting to her play style and trying to get it to get it to, to mesh and i think this last session was the most successful of all the sessions that we've had. Cool. I'm got more of a feel for how, um, I mean, I know you two. I yeah. mean, I've been playing with you two for years at this point. Played uh, as as a player under you game mastering and as a player with Bob and also, you know, ran games. Sure. So uh, it's been interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I've got a, um, I mean, it's, it's good. It takes, I mean. That game provides challenges for me as a game master because there are things that I, feel like should be happening that don't happen because the game doesn't function the way that I always feel like it should be functioning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I mean, my character is very much a, I mean, as textbook superhero as you can get. Uh-huh. So, I mean, in some respects it's, it's, it's pretty easy to play into it because, you know, solar does real superhero things, mm-hmm. even if he's kind of brash and reckless at times, you know, Angela, if you want to come play mass with us, we play on Sunday evenings. Yeah. Every, it's every two weeks, Angela, every other week. Yeah. You just, you, if you want that spot, you just let me know. Seriously. I wouldn't, I would, that would be kind of the most awesome. <laughs> we could even Absolutely. play, we could even play earlier. We could. Yes. If Angela was going to come out, we could even play earlier. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh, yes. Anyway. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Anyway, that was, um, I mean, we all knew it was coming and we yeah. knew it was in your playbook, but like no one thought it was coming up that quick. And then all of a sudden it's like Bob started pushing for it. Right. And then it's like, oh, Morph's going to go like, yeah. this is it. Yeah. The way that, the way that playbook works is like you, if you want to do some stuff, then you have to keep pushing your doom. And I was like, I, you know, I want to do this. I want to, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to ride the wave. And, <laughs> and next thing you know, it's like, oh, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's go. Yeah. Good, good to go. Was, uh, I gave him a choice to actually did. out out yep out skate his doom and he chose not to do it so i mean it was a good story it, it yeah. felt like the right time so yeah yeah and again thunderbirded yep yeah so yeah there was that um i've done a bunch of editing for a bunch of different stuff um finally finished uh cutting printing cutting and sleeving what is hopefully the last playtest set of circle of six and played it again on sunday the game's done by the way yes the game is done awesome we played it uh bob played it with some with two two guys who are local who are very very big board gamers yeah and the one one of the guys was like i love this game i could talk about an hour for an hour about how much i why i love this game it's awesome so that's 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 a that's a really good sign bob also helped me out um Tim finished uh, cards for hydro hackers Mm -hmm. i'm moving away from the bag mechanic and go into a deck mechanic uh and tim made these ridiculous cards they're so gorgeous his his friggin graphic design foo is the best yeah his graphic design design <laughs> foo is, is super good oh. it's a good thing that i have him to pay attention to and learn from yeah, yeah absolutely. The, the cards look so good and bob just printed them all for me and i'm gonna get them cut and sleeved uh before we go to origins so yeah. that um rather than doing the bag of tokens um which i can talk about this in the after show i'm gonna do the deck and I'll, i can explain why um afterwards mm-hmm. so chris what's up with you man so i saw wonder woman twice oh yeah oh i saw wonder woman i saw it mm-hmm Good that stuff. Movie is, we're not we're not gonna we're not spoiling we're not nope. spoiling it don't turn anything it's off. a great movie go enjoy it if you want to hear it spoiled or hear me and angela talk about it you can yeah. go and tune into uh you can go and grab the uh patreon backing level on uh gnome stew and uh, that'll be there in the gnome stew patreon me and me and angela talk about it for t- about 25 minutes that movie is really good like it was really good i gave it it was marvel quality a, as a as a film i gave it an a as a movie as a springboard for female-led projects in hollywood i gave it an a plus uh yep yep 
I, I liked everything about it. I liked every, I, to me, to me, it, it finally is the first time I think DC cracked the Marvel barrier. Like, I think they actually made a movie that um, was a, a absolute solid superhero movie. I will say that I thought in the DC palette, I thought the lighting was still kind of dark um, or it could have been the theater I was in, but it seemed kind of dark, but I think it was the theater you're in, but, um, but overall, um, but overall I, I really enjoyed it. Out of the numerous people I've talked to about that movie, you're the first person that mentioned the dark, the darkness. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, what else? So I watched all of Samurai Jack. Nice. The most recent man. It is so good, Phil. You yeah. should watch it. I should. It's 10 episodes long. That's all. It's 20, a minor commitment. They're for like me. 22 minutes each. So there you go. If anybody's watched Samurai Jack, man, this last, the last season of Samurai Jack, super good. Oh man, there's some time travel stuff with it too. So, I mean, I like <laughs> time travel stories. I mean, the whole thing's a time travel story because it's thrown in the future if you don't know what Samurai Jack is. But uh, yeah, the dealing with ghosts, basically his own madness, super good. All right. So there's that. Uh, what else? I've been doing website design. So uh, I've been working on, um, Actually, a few websites now. I've been working on the Cubicle 7 website. Nice. And I've been working on a new uh, website for... So here's the thing that I'm going to start doing. I'm going to make websites for every different podcast. Oh, kidoki. So that every every podcast... I mean, Mr. Rick and Mark Productions will still be a website, mrrickandmark.com, and it will be the place where we host all the stuff. Sure. But if people want to talk about their shows, if the people who have their shows want to talk about their shows and whatnot, or blog or things like that, they'll have those spaces too. Interesting. Yeah, because I started building a site for Hobbs and Friends. I started messing with the misdirect, the new misdirected Mark website. Okay. So there you go. That'll be in the future. Cool. That's that's going to take a lot of work. So that's not anytime soon. Um, that's just that's, that's a Sunday for, project. That's not a Sunday project. That's a that's a month of Sundays project. No, I said someday. Oh, a Sunday? No, it's a month of Sundays project. Okay. So. I figure an hour a day it'll eventually get done, or an hour every other day. Other things that are going on with me. There's so much. Um. I went to a friend's wedding. That was really fun. I, uh, my friend Matt, uh, congratulations on getting married. I think he, he, uh, I don't know if he listens to the show. I think he might every once in a while, but him and his husband got married. It's the first time I've been to a, a, a wedding where two men were getting married. Oh, nice. It was really cool. Cool. So that was really awesome. They had, um, it was a very nice ceremony. The, the judge had performed 300, uh, ceremonies and he said about that one, it was the nicest set of vows he'd ever heard. Oh, that's, that's yeah, really, they really had cool. really nice vows. So, uh, and he's moving to New Zealand because his husband's from New Zealand. Wow! So he's just gonna he's gonna move right to Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I mean <laughs> he was he spent about six he spent about three months there. I bet you if you go already. there, you never want to come back. Yeah, it's, I mean he had to come back. Oh no, he spent like six months there because I think they kick you out after like a certain amount of time. Right, because your visa and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But so. I'm just saying, like, I'm sure like you go there and just like look around and I mean it just looks like Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that was that was me. So we can move on now since I was last. So some announcements real quick. Really just one announcement. Um, if you would like to advertise with Misdirected Mark Productions, you can reach out to me at chris at misdirectedmark.com. In the subject, just put sponsor uh, ad sponsorship on Misdirected Mark or something of that nature. The prices are we do one ad spot for 20 bucks, or you can get two ad spots for $35. And they're going to sound something like this because we're about to read an ad for the happiest apocalypse on earth, which we should start doing currently i think he's talking to you bob no no it's me no it's him no i just meant you should have the notes open oh, i have the notes oh open. that's good okay all right because because what you're buying is handcrafted this is artisanal artisanal, artisanal yes. copy. absolutely, yeah. absolutely <laughs> yeah. artisanal this is artisanal this is all right go ahead so this is the happiest apocalypse on earth ready right. i'm ready spot here we go phil i've been looking into this game the happiest apocalypse on earth okay all right i don't want to get into this craziness from last time so you know it's not evil and it's just a game now, right? No, it is totally evil and a gateway to the end of all existence. Oh boy, here we go again. Look, people out there in listener land, the great mouse god is real. Go check out the Kickstarter of the Happiest Apocalypse on Earth by Christopher Gray. The mouse park is feeding on the life force of all of us, and if we don't continually appease the great mouse god, it will awaken and eat us all, or make us sing it's a small world after all for all eternity. I mean, I can't figure out which one is in the ancient Sumerian section I found in the game. Hey, hey. There's not really an ancient Sumerian section, is there? Yeah. Y- yeah. No. But it's true. Chris, I think you need to calm down. No, there will be no calming. It might look like a satirical game of cultists, ghouls, and mon- monsters that makes uh, homage to the X-Files and Supernatural, but I know this book is a gateway to evil. Yeah, maybe all that's true. 
but can we have fun with this so-called evil? Uh, it sounds like it. I mean, it looks like it's a Powered by the Apocalypse game that lets you build your own park, has sanity mechanics, and an incident framework. So it's totally got stuff that's going to help GMs create sessions. Well, yeah. It says here it's a turnkey toolbox for narrators to create interesting and horrifying sessions, um, as well as many sample incidents that can be played with no prep, which is you know always fun for you. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing um, I think we all like to see in a game. I mean, yeah. I think it just sounds like evil. That's ridiculous. Is it? Is it really? Uh, yeah, uh, it's kind maybe, of ridiculous. Yeah. Fine. I mean, I guess we'll find out when we get the game. And I implore all of you out there in listener land to get the happiest apocalypse on Earth and stomp out all the evil that you find within it. Click on the link in the show notes or just type happiestapocalypse.com into your navigation bar. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here, check this out. And welcome to the workshop where we try to build better games. Nah, That's totally a new bumper. <laughs> nah, no, that doesn't sounds, work. It, it sounds like it sounds like you're trying to debut a new opening for the show. Oh, okay, fine, I'll try again. Yeah, no, that, 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 that gotta, definitely ain't it. Okay. I tried. Yeah, no, that that was weird. I, I, I tried. I really did. I tried. Did you try hard? I, I did that time. <laughs> really? Yeah. Did you Google like workshop sounds? I I Googled workshop rock. Workshop rock. Yeah, that's what I got. Okay. Okay. Um, Is that on TV like cop rock? Sure. Oh. Sure. Send a cop rock was a TV show on ABC <laughs> in the nineteen eighties, right? Late eighties. Uh, yeah, I believe it was, it was a yeah. musical police uh, procedural drama. It was um, a train wreck, for yeah. lack of a better it term. Was, it, it was terrible, man. It was. It was, it was a train wreck. A bunch of knuckleheads. All right, now that we're like twenty five minutes, twenty minutes into the show, we're actually in the ah, workshop talking about. So it's about, a panda's opening, yeah, is what you're a, saying. Well, I mean, we we're got there. going long, but we don't edit. <laughs> so um, immersion. Now, this talk topic came about a few sessions ago talking about playing in character, which is often a euphemism for immersion. In that, me and Phil expressed that we had some thoughts on this, and thus a topic was born. So tonight, we are going to go deep, or get some sweet, sweet immersion. We're going to talk about what it is, how important it is, games that support it, as well as how to get into it, keep it going, and what breaks it up. But to get started, we need to do what we always do. Phil, buddy, old pal, old friend, would you please hit us with a definition? Immerse us in the definition. All right, let's get into it. Um, we're going to have to build our way into this a little. All right, so immersion, right? The word itself means deep mental involvement. Let's build on that character immersion. This is the act of getting into the mind of our character and playing them in first person rather than third person. So things are like we are speaking as the character, we are feeling the character's emotions. All of the heart. Yeah, the heart. The yep. heart. Um, you are you are planning as your character. So you're, you know, plotting and planning as your character. Um, and you're not really thinking about the meta elements of the game. Mm -hmm. Nor are you thinking about what else is going on around you. In fact, a lot of times when we talk about this character immersion, this is like when... Um, and people describe it often as like the rest of the room dropped away or when I looked at everyone else at the table, like I saw their characters, mm -hmm. you know, like we've all, I, I mean, I certainly have had that experience. Like, have you had it? No. Really? You've never had it? Not once in my life. Wow. I don't Bob? play, I don't play games for that reason. Um, off the top of my head. I've had a few times, I mean, it doesn't happen to me a lot for a lot of the same reasons we're going to talk about, um, about with, with you, but I've had a few times where I've had those moments where I've been, um, like kind of totally immersed in character, um, and, and digging it. Um, so anyway, um, a lot of times we talk about that, like things falling away from the table, um, that we kind of get focused that we just kind of see the character and the other characters in the game. So why is, um, why is immersion important? Uh, so first of all, immer immersion, because it, it, you're going to get tied up in feelings, um, is going to create a deeper emotional connection to the game. That's true. It, I mean, you're just, if you're feeling as your character, if you're feeling the excitement of the battle with a dragon or the excitement of a car chase through the streets of Paris, if you're like feeling that in some, on some personal level, your emotional connection to the game is deepening. It's true. Okay. Um, Truthfully, it's this is um, this is the kind of experience that is harder to create in other games 
than role playing games. Like role playing games have a real advantage of creating this kind of effect. Man, I, I think that's so strange because I think role playing games are actually at a huge disadvantage. I think LARP is the best way to do this. Well, I think LARP is certainly yes. I will. I won't disagree. I think LARP has probably LARP when we talk about the things that um, that go into making immersion. You'll see why LARP actually um, winds up having a stronger advantage. Mm-hmm. But like it's, I don't get this as much in a role in a video game. Yeah. I, I get, I get, I can get a flow state going in a video game, like where I'm just kind of in the groove and like you know, trucking around killing monsters kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I don't get like a character transference. Like I don't get, um, and I will admit I have not played Mass Effect to depth. So there may be some people who are like, no, 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 it's totally possible at a game like you know, qu- like a quality game like Mass Effect. Anyway, um, I will agree with you that certainly in LARP, you don't really see it in board games. You don't really see it in card games. Uh, you don't really see it in minis. Like you don't really have anyone kind of like, you know, embodying their inquisitor, um, you know, as the rhino tank is rolling across the field kind of thing. Yeah, The video games that got me close to, closest to that were the Telltale ones. So you've probably never played a Telltale game. What was that dark game that you played? Because you really liked you... dark. The one with the flashlight and the. Oh, that was Alan Wake. That, Alan game was, Wake. that game was fun. But I mean, I was. Didn't immerse. Yeah, because there's mechanics, right? Yeah. So the. The thing with, I mean, we'll talk about it later, I'm sure, but the thing, the reason that the Telltale games do such a good job is because there's not as many mechanics in them, really. It's really just about walking around and doing things and making choices. And when you can, and it's, a lot of times it's first person, so when you're making choices from the first person, Mm -hmm. it feels like you're in the game. It gets you a little closer. Yeah, and then if you set the room for yourself the way that you want to, like if I'm playing the Walking Dead one, and I turn all the lights off, and it's just me and the computer screen on, then everything can sort of drop away. Yep. Um, I mean, I used to do that playing, um, uh, what was it? Uh, Half-Life and then scare yeah, the shit yeah, out of myself. Yeah, there you go. See, like. Play Half-Life in the dark, man. You will, you will knock off a year or two of your life. Yeah, and first person shooters are good for that kind of play because you are, you are the, you, you are, are the, the visual eyes. eyes yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, in order to kind of keep talking about immersion, we really, we need to talk about two other, uh, topics. One of which, um, we actually dedicated a whole episode to. We did. We did, in fact. And real quick, before we, we get into layers, which is what we're going to talk about, you talked about when everything drops away and you're just in the, you're just your character. For me, that's not what happens. The, the, that state for me is when I can picture like above the table that we're playing, basically the three dimensional movie of what's going on. So I'm going to say that I'm, I'm going to say, does that happen to you more when you're GMing? That happens to me in both cases. Okay. Cause I, I'm going to call that something slightly different than immersion. Yeah, that's, that's fine. But that's, 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 as, but, that's as immersed as I get in a role playing. Okay. Game. Well, and that's okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, take me back to layers. When we talked about this a while ago by the look of the show number. Yes. In episode 209, which was, you know, 50 ish episodes ago, <laughs> 52, in fact, uh, that was our layers of the game episode. And these are mental locations where your focus is on different parts of the game. So here are the six levels that we came up with. And you could also use these as Venn diagrams or whatever, but they are character group game story campaign and personal. So the character level is that place where a person goes when they want to be immersed in the character. Like we're talking about when they want to just all the things that you already right, just defined. Be. Yeah. Um, but as we talked about with levels, this is really hard to get to and maintain because the demands of the game and the demands of the environment will pull at us to get us away from that. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that um, after the for, after the break. Yeah. So you, we sort of hinted at it. I think you mentioned it actually earlier, yep, the flow state. So would you pe- let people know what a flow state is and why uh, character immersion is a type of flow state? Yeah. So flow state is uh, not a gaming term. Uh, flow state is um, it's a mental uh, productivity kind of thing. Um, I, I came, th- I came at it from productivity, but I'm sure it comes at it. Um, people come at it from a couple other different places, but it's a mental state of operation, um, in which a person is performing an activity is fully immersed, uh, in the feeling, um, with energized focus, full involvement and enjoyment of the process. So I get flow state, um, for me, um, well, let me just, let me stop for a second. Like you said, um, character immersion is a type of flow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but where I experience flow more often is as a GM. Yeah, me too. Like flow state for me as a GM is that moment. And I get, and I can get it fairly frequently flow state in a game when I'm GMing is when everything in the game is clicking. And no matter what the players do, 
I'm making connections to other material. I'm like already creating what's going to happen and I'm just playing off of everyone. Mm -hmm. And it's that really fluid, you know, when you're at the table and you're just having, you know, it's the players are doing, I'm taking it. I'm like, I'm taking it, I'm adding on to it, pushing it right back onto the table. Yep. There's no, and there's very little, um, discord. Yeah. It's like really, and, and, and really there's no discord. Right. And it's fantastic. Like that. I love that flow state and that flow state, um, actually get that flow state when we're on the mics as well, mm -hmm. because for as much of the show as we script, there's a lot of the show that we ad lib and that flow state kicks in where, you know, we're, I'm connecting ideas while we're talking. Oh, we've been in the flow state since we started this segment. Yeah. Yeah. Time will fall away. And uh, that's why we always go long. Um, and it also gives me the GM high. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. The, the the end result of that flow state, there's a come down. It's true. From that focus. So there is some debate about the intensity of immersion because um, there are a lot of gamers, the method actors, they strive for a con a set of continuous immersion. They want to be in that space constantly. Yeah. Our friends over a prismatic tsunami kind of like try to live for this. Yeah. And I think it's ridiculous, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm not going to use the word ridiculous, but I, I don't, I think one, it's hard. And two, I don't think it's the only thing you can do. I will say, I think it's ridiculous because of the kind of games that they're playing with, they're trying to achieve it with. We'll talk they should about be playing. It. They should be basically playing parlor arps if they want to do that, yeah, which is well, fine. And we'll talk about yeah. ways to make it easier. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, go ahead. So, um, these folks, they want uh, to open the game, immerse into character, and stay there until a break where the game is over. Like, that is the, those are, that's what they want. But this is really hard for a bunch of reasons. So there are external distractions. That's somebody coming into the room um, who's not playing. There is... Um, the pizza guy shows yeah, up. Yeah, the pizza guy shows up. The phone rings. You know, there's all kinds of things. And the power goes out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, um, there's the other layers of the game that get in the way of being in just the character state, which is, you know rules yeah combat mechanics turns. mechanics yeah and uh, there's nothing uh, we're not disparaging any of this stuff no like, no i mean that's part just, of playing the game we talked yeah. we talked about this in layers yeah. like sometimes it, you got to shift yeah it just gets in the way if you want to constantly stay in the character state that's all like yep. th those if the goal is that these are the things that hamper it right i mean like if you've all of a sudden got to look up you know um delayed blast fireball mm -hmm. like you're not in your character anymore. Yeah. There's also the thing, like, if we're participants, uh, that means we're it, we're participants and we're also audience. So we're we're observing the game. If our character isn't in a scene, we're still there watching. Yeah. And and that is that is a that is a different space. You are in a different space. Yeah. At that so moment. we are not immersed in character at that point in time because we are not participating. We are not in our character. We are just observing. Yes. So the. Um, there are some ways to do this, though. There are ways to get into that character state and stay there for as long as possible and as often as possible. Uh, one is to play quietly. In, in, not quietly. Not play quietly. somewhere. Play in a quiet yeah. space. Um, turn your cell phones off. And then, you know, play games where everyone has a high degree of system mastery, whether that is everybody knows all the rules so that you don't have to really g deal with them very much. Like, everybody just kind of knows what to do so you can keep it on the side. Or play games that have a low amount of rules so that you're not accessing them very often. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this is why some players, um, this is why some groups love playing just one game, mm -hmm. right? Because they've reached a level of system mastery, which is, I think, a show we also did, right? Like yeah, eons ago. I don't know if we did system mastery. I don't we, know. we need to re re revisit that. We need topic to go check. Point. We may go to check the archives on that. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, there are, reason, there are reasons why, like, some people only play one game and they play it forever is that you, le you reach that system mastery and you no longer have to think about that. Mm hmm. Okay. So that's continuous immersion. Um, but there are gamers who don't actually seek continuous immersion, but actually still appreciate the concept of immersion. Mm -hmm. um, and so games that have frequent level shifting. So if you have a game that has um, not only a rules component, but a um, metagame component. So, you know, if it's a story game and you're kind of also like table writer, so High Plains Samurai, for instance, where, yep. you, you know, where you're creating uh, NPCs and stuff, injecting them in the game and using other people's I mean, NPCs for building scenes. Hearts Blazing is this because people aren't just their characters or advocating for the characters they are advocating for uh, parts of the setting. Exactly. Yeah. Hearts Blazing is definitely one that doesn't um, that doesn't do that. Um, if you're running more casual tables. So if you're having a high social component where you're like laughing and joking with your friends, we tend to do that from time to time when like when we're to with Tony and Dave. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not always so we're not over. We're not always super serious. Yeah, that's 
I mean, Tony is, Tony wants to game, but Tony also just needs a break from his life. Yeah. To, like to he socialize. likes he likes to escape. Yeah. yeah. And Dave is a lot the same way too. Like he needs a sometimes he just wants to game and sometimes he really just wants a break from his life. Yeah. So, you know, if you're running a casual table, sometimes you pop up to the personal level and, you know, you're chit-chatting or making mm-hmm. jokes. Um, groups that play in public spaces. Public spaces are really hard to um to maintain that immersion because like if you're playing in the corner of a Starbucks or a corner of a Panera. Yeah, Panera. Since we do that. Every <laughs> right. We, other we week. do that. We play at a corner of Panera. And it, I mean, sometimes you want to have this immersive moment, but there's the dude who's like racking bread. Right behind right behind yeah. us. We we and we sometimes stop and talk to the the the, yeah. the person who is back there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean yeah, I mean it, it can be hard. Now, um in those cases, if you're not seeking continuous immersion, and this is how I think we actually got onto this topic, because this is I think where you and I were both heading, is that um bursts of immersion are perfectly fine yet it there's i really do enjoy when people have those the um the conversations the dramatic conversations yeah especially when they're conversations that aren't just about nothing they're conversations that are about um somebody setting some stakes and somebody asking like the petitioner grantor thing from sure like that that idea exists everywhere well like for like for instance um couple weeks ago oh we were playing second. i just said petitioner granter and if nobody knows what that hill means folk. i'm talking about hill folk sorry about i knew exactly what i knew what you i know i realized like yeah. it's from the drama system it's the idea that someone is petitioning someone else for something and that person either grants them or denies them yes and then if they grant them it they somebody gets tokens if somebody if they deny them that then they have then to pay tokens they have to pay tokens yeah, yeah and that's that's the economy of uh of the hill game folk. yeah so a couple of weeks ago we were playing masks and um my character found out that his mom was not a um, a pencil pusher, but rather a lead scientist for the um, sketchy, um, the sketchy uh, tech company in Uh, our inner city. Neotech. And I went home that night. um, I went home that night to confront her um, and, and do the peer beyond the mask where I was going to try to find out if, you know, what she was lying about. And, um, for i don't know 10 maybe 15 minutes um we played the scene you played mom mm-hmm. and uh i pl- i played kyle and um we got into an argument about superheroes we did because um i had done stuff earlier that day that um and she does not like superheroes correct and we got into a big argument about superheroes i blew the role for pure the mask so you actually took a move which i was actually to um impose labels on me uh-huh um, I rejected those, I rejected the labels and like the fight got, the, the argument escalated, right? Mm-hmm. Cause I got mad at her when she tried to, um, impose, you know, more mundane on me. And, um, it's funny cause I just said you you're angry. Mark the angry tag. Yeah. For, for no reason other than you were angry. I was, when I actually said it. I, I was like, I'm angry. And you're like, Mark the angry tag. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> I'm like, I am like, <laughs> like I was angry. Yeah. But that, but for me, that 15 minutes like I was my character. Mm-hmm. Like we were, I mean, and it didn't, it didn't hurt that we were playing at a dining room table. Like we were at a dining room table having an argument and I was arguing with my mom. Yeah. Like, and I was your mom. Right. And she was unreasonable. Right. I mean, cause it's, I mean, she was unreasonable to her son because she has a, a bunch of principles and ideas that you, uh-huh. know, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. And she's wrong, but that's fine. Yeah. She's, <laughs> she's, she's so wrong that you were starting to come around to her way of thinking. Yeah. And then, she, no, she then did the adult thing. She was like, well, you can have your own opinions. I was like, yeah, I can <laughs> fine. Like, and walked off kind of thing. Anyway, it was a really good scene and it was a pocket of immersion. Yeah. Like, and, and those things, um, and those are fine. Like it's, it's okay to try for the continuous immersion if that's your thing. But if you like immersion and you're, you know, if, if you've been thinking like, yeah, I do like character immersion, but I really don't want to try to invest in it because it seems like I have to do continuous immersion. You don't. No, you don't. You don't. Seek the pockets. Mm-hmm. Seek these little, these deep little scenes and have them um, and then come out of them and do other stuff. I mean, we had that deep scene and then you actually cut spotlight over to Nikki and I popped like I popped completely out and like wrote some notes and you know, whatever. And it was fine. It was like, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was good. We were done. Like I had, like I had a taste that was really good. And then, you know, and then we were back out. Yeah. And I was going to say something. There's nothing wrong with talk with, with, with shifting back and forth. Like, because, and there's, Oh, I know what I was going to say. Sorry. Um, some kinds of play are better in certain levels than others. Yeah. Especially depending on game. Right. Because, um, dungeon world, it's a lot of narrating what you're doing. 
Yes. Because a lot of it's action-based. It's not necessarily conversation-based because the only conversation move in the game is parlay. Yeah. Yeah. So everything is about the game. A lot of it's about the game and the story level. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, 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 Dungeon World and other Powered by the Apocalypse games actually um, shift you. So you're narrating where you could stay immersed. Mm-hmm. But then when you hit the move, um, unless you have the moves memorized, and I've never memorized the moves, I, I got to pop out. And then... I mean, you have to pop out for a couple of reasons. One, I have to roll the dice and, and determine what I got. But if I get a seven to nine, I have to pick, mm-hmm. which then pops me out to like the meta level. Yep. Because now I got to think like, well, what's best for the story here? Like, is it cooler that I move into danger or should I just blow like a point of ammo? Like a eh, point of ammo sounds weak. I'm going to move into danger. Right. And then make that decision and then pop back in. Mm-hmm. So part of what goes with these bursts of immersion is that there's a skill for learning how to get immersed again, just like there is for flow state. Like there's a way to train yourself to kind of get into flow state faster. There are ways to practice immersion Mm -hmm. so that you can immerse quickly and come back out and immerse quickly again. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's what you're trying to seek. I I think you're trying to seek it anytime. If you're, whether you're into um, continuous long immersed play or whether you're into these bursts, the, the faster you can immerse uh, the better it's going to be for you. Yeah, and before we get there, because we're going to talk about that right after the break, after uh-huh. we go to the chat room, um, let's talk about a few games that have mechanics which, which support immersion. So mm-hmm. I think LARPs are great for this because they don't have a lot of mechanical aspects. Right. I mean, often they're in um, often they're in blocked off rooms. Uh-huh. Like if if we look at a convention, uh, LARPs are almost always off in their own little place where like when we play a role playing game, like there may be seven tables around us of other people playing. Mm hmm. Uh, hell, I mean, one year at UBCon, I ran my Dungeon World game with a boffer fight at my back. Yeah. Right. I mean, talk about talk about screwed on immersion. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm, uh, I mean, you could have just changed your game to be like, there's a battle raging. Well, out I just you. I just used <laughs> it. I mean, I used it for the climax. Like I was just yelling and screaming at that point. Right. Yeah. But but it's hard to have those scenes where like 20 people are like bashing each other with nerf weapons behind you. Yeah. I mean, that's, and not lightly. I mean, no, if you've ever listened no, to no, those no. guys, um like Kate and those guys, like they beat the hell out of each other. Tangent when Kate, that is, yeah. she's a dagger here player. Uh, anyway. Um, so, so LARP LARP. And yeah. really it's games that have a lot of, um, conversational interaction. Mm-hmm. And LARPs also have light rules because you're standing having conversations. Yeah. I was just thinking about some, some LARPs have more rules than others, right? Cause you have character sheets and whatnot that have like dots and things like that. And I'm, if I'm not really super well versed in the third, uh, the, the mind's eye, the game. mind's eye game, but I mean, they use a deck of cards. You had 10 cards. Yeah. yeah. It's not a, I mean, right. I mean, a lot but, of LARP systems use like rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, but but the Wick, the John Wick, um, Blood, uh, the... Blood and Honor? Not Blood and Honor. No, the, 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 the Samurai. The Houses of the Blooded. Of the blooded. It, has a LARP, it has LARP rules. And it's not about, it's not about um, numbers on cards. It's about how many cards you have to ante. Yeah. So really, it's a simple thing because you can just, you can put how many cards you want behind your back or whatever and be like... And you can, you can petition or it's like that petition grantor thing. It's something like that. When there's a conflict, you'll find a game master mm-hmm. or a, a, whoever's running the game and you, and you, you both put how many cards you have behind your back and then you, then you show. Right. And if you win, you get what you want, I think, and give them to either the game master or the other person. So then they have currency. Yeah. So, I mean, LARP, yeah. LARP, I mean, LARPs are designed for immersion, right? Like they, they work. I mean, they act, they actively work on creating immersion. I mean, what's that? Um, oh, it's a fantastic, um, game jason morningstar wrote it it's about um, a group of mountain climbers um and they're they're one day away from ascending to the top and not all of them are going to be able to ascend to the top and so they're like in a tent discussing it yeah and 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 you like you take tape and like mark out the spot the size of a tent on the floor Mm -hmm. and everyone goes and sits in it yep right like that's immersive and we're going to talk about after the break or you could just pitch a tent yeah. Oh, yeah. If you have a tent, just then they just bring it. Yeah. Uh, and we'll talk about this after the break, but um, that's part of the components of immersion. Yeah. Right. I mean, and anytime you interact with a mechanic, it is breaking immersion. It's just how often you mm-hmm. have to interact with the mechanics. Yeah. And how complicated are the mechanics to get through so you can get back to being immersed? Yeah, because you can. I mean, you can have like a little dip in immersion to handle, like to to resolve a, uh, an action. Uh huh. But the longer it takes, or the more complicated the action the more you're falling out of immersion. It's true. I've also had a, th- a thought too, where like, cause games are mostly about conversations. Like if you had a game where the mechanics are all done with touch. Yeah. Like touching things in front of you and the conversation just stay, stay there. Then you can actually stay in 
I feel like it's easier to stay in the character immersion because people can just look at the look at the prompts. Yeah, because you can just you can talk and see the prompt and then just keep going. Yeah. You know what you know where we do that a little to help immersion? Hmm. Um I, I, I do it when I run um when I'm playing fiasco is uh, while the scene's going oh, on, yeah, you just, you slide. I'll hold up the two dice, ah. I'll pull the table, and then when it's ready, without interrupting the scene that's going on, I will present the I will present the player who whose scene it is, the color die, mm-hmm. and not say a word. Like just slide them like the black die, and then they know, like take the story, like take the story and finish it, you know, against you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's another way to stay immersed. All right. Well, let's go to the chat room and see. Um, oh, I, I was going to mention one other oh, game. Go ahead. Um, I forgot about Ten Candles. Ten Candles is Ten Candles creates a great immersive experience. It's yeah, it does because the 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 candles are part of the mechanic, right? And the lights are off, mm-hmm. and it's super. So the lights are off. So no matter where you have, no matter what was in the room you played in, as soon as you turn off the lights, um, and especially once you've played, once you've once you're partway into the game and some of the candles are out, um the space gets smaller. It feels like it. Yeah. Right. And everybody leans smaller. in more because you still need to see your character thing. And you're like, everybody's leaning into the table. Um, and it's super quiet. Mm-hmm. Um, here's another design thing for people who want to design immersive games. The closer that you can take your mechanics of your game to the actual play of the game, like the interactions, your environment. Yeah. yeah. The, especially where in the character level. Yep. And then the the more immersive the game can be. Right. And 10 Candles has like some really simple mechanics. Like you just have a couple of index cards with some traits on them. Uh-huh. And you make, you know, and there's there's a couple roles, but the, you know, it's not heavy. Yeah. Um, and it becomes a much more, um, much more narration. Yeah, okay. And because of the environment, the way it's set up, it's easier to get re-immersed in the game. And, and honestly, to pause for a second, when we prepped the show... Um, I came up with those two examples and then I was like, Chris, what other games, like what other games have mechanics that aid immersion? And we both were like, uh, uh I don't know. So, so they, chat room. Yeah, there's not like a ton. Right. So chat room, um, if you know, uh, other games, which by the way, um, I mean, you I, Rob Abrazado just named the climb is the Jason morning star. Yeah, LARP. I mean, yeah, yep. there, there you go. Um, but if anyone else knows any <clears throat> RPGs, not specifically LARPs, but RPGs that, uh, work towards immersion, um, LARPs are RPGs too. No, they are, but I'm, I'm talking, I mean, but I'm talking about the tabletop, tabletop role playing yeah, games. Yeah, tabletop. Yeah, don't, don't do that. I'm not, I'm not picking fights with the LARP community. I love those guys. I know. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's do it. Yeah. So, um, Nikki had a, an interesting question. Like, are, are there really any mechanics that you don't pop out for when you resolve like a challenge or something like that? If there's mechanics... I think it. You think you always pop out, but I think it's how f- it's how it's, far out, how far out, and, and like the duration. Like if yeah. it's like a to hit roll, like in D and D. Like let's say I'm immersed in D and D because it could happen, and I know my character backwards and forwards, right? And the GM's like, "What are you going to do?" And I'm like, "You know, I run up to the goblin, I swing my sword, and attempt to cleave him in half. I can like I can quickly roll the die, add my five to it, and be like, and I I strike, like." I don't have to fall that far out of immersion, but if I pick like one of like, let's say I'm playing a cleric and I pick like one of my obscure spells because like we're in some weird scene and I'm like, Oh, I think like that spell might work. Oh, I don't remember how that spell works. And I'm like flipping through the book. Then like I'm like I'm out. There's, there's no game that I can think of that doesn't require you to break immersion in some way, shape or form. Right. And, and that's, and that's why we talked about earlier, the faster you can slide back in. Yep the better there's there's also i also think people who want to play games that are wholly immersive are, are, are that's silly well go i mean you should start exploring LARPs even 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 those have mechanics though, yeah but i right? mean yes yes but i mean you can get you can get far longer like, into i that. want a wholly immersive experience i'm like it doesn't really exist i mean for me and i guess this is a good time to talk about it before we jump back in the topic while i love immersion and i love pockets of immersion um i love the meta component of games me too that's so i like playing games right yeah. so it's hard for me. Like I can't immerse because I want to like, I start taking character actions, not based all the time on exactly what's the best thing for my character, but what's the best thing for the story. Like what's cool for the story. Yeah. And, and that's, and, and that's okay. That's a player preference. That's a thing I like, but I, but to do that, like even when we play masks, like sometimes I, I don't take tactically, I don't always take tactically great moves. I take moves that, I think will make the story better. Like I grab a bad guy and blow out of the side of the building and leave the scene. Mm-hmm. 
Like, that's not necessarily good for Bob and Nikki, but it's in character. So, like, I know what it was. It was the time, like, I rescued my mom from Mm -hmm. the attack. Like, I left for a while and left you with a, like, way more powerful bad guy. Mm -hmm. That's not tactically smart. No, you did the thing that was best for your family. Right, but I also did the thing that was like, no, he would totally do this. And, and, And the story will be better because playing teen superheroes, I also know on a meta level, they can't quite be killed like that. Like, they can get their asses kicked. But they're not in any real dire straits. And if anything, they'll just be pissed at me later yeah. for doing it. I'm like, that could be a cooler story. Yeah. Plus, absolutely. you got to have a scene with your mom when you dropped her off in a safe spot. Uh huh. <laughs> and not tell her who I was. Yeah, yeah that was funny. Uh, yes, miss. You'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I totally recognize you. <laughs> look, look, I want to talk about that. Um, The idea of. Uh, so, when you, if you want to play a game that is wholly immersive. So games have mechanics. So you have to have some sort of mechanic within your game. So your mechanic needs to be part of the immersive experience. So whatever your choice points are or things like that, they have to be part of the character actions. Otherwise, you can't actually have a wholly immersive experience. Uh, I mean, the closest thing that we get to that really is when people is like long form improv. And that's not those aren't games. Those are those are people acting. Right. I mean, I've done some LARP versions of Amber. I mean, Bob's done them, too, because we used to um, once or twice per campaign, I would do um we would go to when Bob and I had a uh, shared in a shared a house, we would go to the basement and actually set up like a full dinner party kind of thing and have all the other players over. And Amber has no rules. I mean, it has rules. Well, it has. I'm sorry. It has rules. It has no dice. It has no dice. And so it's really easy um, I mean, to adjudicate things on the fly. You can just translate the numbers into I'm the greatest whatever in the world. Right. And if, if so therefore, I, and then, you know, then you can narrate that you do the thing. Yeah. And so then we just like, we would have, like we would play an hour or two um, like that with people going back and forth. And then I would throw an event in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And those were really, and those were super immersive. Like those were, those were a lot of fun to do. Yeah. Any other questions from the, I, I saw Nikki say that, She's had cases where she's LARPed. Yeah. Hour plus immersed. I can easily see that. Yeah, because if you don't engage the mechanics, then it's not hard. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, um, I keep wondering if it's if it continues to be. I mean, it is a game at that point because that at that point you're advocating for your character and wheeling and dealing, right? And that's a kind of play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Jared Rasher had a thought. Given that most of our role-playing experience is essentially hyper-reality, Breaking out to the rules allows you to analyze the story on the meta level to contemplate the needs of the story and not just the inertia of the character. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> that's the way you I wholeheartedly agree. Well, yeah, that's that's absolutely <laughs> yeah. true. Yeah. That that's is. that's that's where I mean, when you're doing that, you sometimes do things with your character. <laughs> that's not... Strangely enough, we just said that not too long ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean <laughs> thank you for echoing us or us echoing you. Either way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we're on the same page. Uh-huh. Thanks, Jared. There you go. Uh, Ange had a, a, a great quote earlier in the in the session too. Uh, Immersion is the magic that happens when you have the right GM and the right players telling the right story in the right game at the correct moment in time. I, don't, I mean, that's the flow. It's. it's I mean, that's where everything clicks it's together. A like, magic moment where everything. Sure, but is that immersion? Well, I well, mean, I've had some very immersive scenes as a GM. I mean, like, I mean, as a GM, like, I've I've gotten this close to. So not character immersion, but game immersion. Yeah, I mean that just sounds like an awesome game. Well, I mean, I guess it's the definition. Like, I have, I mean, I've had more than one experience where, in the middle of a game, it's gotten so good that I stop seeing everyone at the table and I'm only seeing the game. Yeah, the end of Airy Peaks was like that. Yeah, I don't have that ever. So I mean, I get it. Yeah, I mean the end for me, the end of Airy Peaks, like I could vividly see the dragon. Yeah, and the fight that was going on. Remember, I don't play as much as ever. I don't play that much as, yeah. a, as a player. Yeah. So, I, I, so you're usually my role is the game master. Yeah. Most so you're experiencing the GM flow state all the time. Right. But like, I totally like. I got to a point where um, I got to a point where Corin and I like shared a lot of headspace together. Like, mm-hmm. it got very easy after a while to become Corin and to just like be Corin at the table. Um, in all the like terrible and wonderful ways that that involved being Corin, yeah. but yeah um yeah i totally loved um, i don't think what Ange said is wrong i just think it's so generalized that it doesn't mean much uh i 
but I get what she's saying. Like, I mean, we do because I've, we just talked about all that stuff. Right, but I've hit right those, I've hit those magical moments. Um, like, it's the good opening paragraph to, or the opening statement to an argument for immersion. And then you have to fill in all the stuff that we just talked uh-huh. about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those, those things happen because dot, dot, dot. Yeah. I mean, the right time, you know, has to do a lot. I mean, even the right story beats can help bring everyone into the same space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we just right. we did that thing. Let's uh, roll back in. Uh yeah, thank you. Let's roll back in. All right, so um let's do it from the player's perspective. So this will be a little harder for Chris cuz um Chris is going to um Chris is going to go on, you know, what we're saying not as much as uh having experienced it. I never realized that. I should have asked you that before we did the No, but you're right. I it mean, gives you... me it gives me my point of view, which is good. Yeah. I mean, I love um I mean, I do actually get to play a decent amount. I don't love play, to I don't love being a player character all that much, so it's not that big a deal. Really? Oh, I like. Well, I like. I like. I like when you run stuff. So I like. <laughs> I, I like playing. I like playing in your games. I, uh, I play because, you know, the the best. I hate saying this because I mean it's it's not one of your games. The best play experience I've had so far is playing in the Streets of Avalon. I got to be Vassar because that crew, those conversations sometimes took on those mm-hmm. those moments, but. And it worked really well for me because I'm really auditory. Yeah. And we're playing online. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I usually don't stream my camera and I don't look at everybody else's cameras. So I'm just listening to everybody's voice. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that you works love, for me. You love audio drama and podcasts. I do. So it's totally, it, that, that actually immerses me. That's actually immersed me more than any other play experience I've ever had. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We could just keep you on a box somewhere else. <laughs> you know, we'll to just, have you here we'll just put me we'll just put me behind a um a, a filing cabinet and open up the filing cabinet we'll i can be the, the voice from behind well, the filing off cabinet. camera we'll get the screen over there yeah. that's covering the sump pump we'll just yeah. put you behind the screen all right anyway in a box. all right so um so yeah let's now talk about immersion um a little somewhat mechanically uh and we're going to start by talking about how to get immersed um because we're always going to start outside of immersion uh and we're going to try to get there uh, while we're playing. Um, and everyone's going to have their own approach. There's no right or wrong way to do this. Whatever works for you to get immersed is going to be good, but you're going to have to do some experimentation. Um, what I did is, um, what I did was I pulled the G plus community last week and asked them for some tips for immersion. Uh, I read everything they had. I kind of bucketed these into a couple general, general areas and I, uh, worked everyone's, um, advice into this, uh, into this list about getting immersed. So thank you G plus community for contributing, uh, to tonight's discussion in advance. Uh, so Chris, what is the first element for, um, working on getting immersed? Well, as we just talked about, the environment apparently is very important, especially for somebody like me. Cause if I'm playing over an audio medium, it works better. Mm-hmm. So they, that can help or harm immersion. Uh, conductive elements are like, uh, I'm not cannot conductive. Sorry, conducive. conducive elements are things such as being isolated, quiet, uh, lighting to suit play. I mean, that's the play space that you want. Setting up your play space is an important thing to do. Absolutely. Then you know you might want to get some things around that play space to uh, set the atmosphere. So props such as ten candles. Uh yeah, S- certainly. Music helps. Uh yeah, if you uh, if you dig soundtracks yeah. for your games, music is such a hard thing for me because I always want the music to go with the the story, scene, the scenes, but. Yeah. Even then, it, like it can be tricky because if you're playing reactive games, then you never know where a scene's gonna go. Because I had no idea, like when we were playing Mass, that Bob's thing was gonna go that way. So let me can I give you an example for music? Oh yeah, sure. So um, years ago, when I was running my heist campaign, um, Gilgore, Sean Gilgore, patron of the show, uh, made CD mixes for every character in the game, and each character, including my GM PC, had a CD of music that was themed for their character. And so we would just put a couple of them in the CD changer back when these things happened in CD changers. <laughs> um, but we would just have that on in the background. And it was just like it was everybody's character music. Oh, nice. And it was cool because the music was very um, – Sean did a very good job, very musically inclined and picked these um, – this really eclectic mix of songs that kind of captured that uh, Vegas criminal – uh, kind of element. I mean, it had everything from some hardcore rap to um, Sinatra, mm-hmm. things like like it was really good. Good stuff. Um, absolutely. Like, yeah, I loved um, music for props. I don't. I, you don't do too many props. 
Um, because I'm as lazy as humanly possible. For Amber, I used to have a lot of props for my game because I had different elders who had different props. Do you know um, why I'm as lazy as humanly possible? Because the fourth edition game that I ran had minis and props and sets. Yes, it had a world of its a world of unto itself of uh-huh. stuff. I mean, I was building things out of like right. styrofoam and stuff. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, props. Um, having props helps. Um, decorating a room, right? What else? What are some other things? So then there's um, then there's a uh, the time that you play the game. Uh-huh. So. For instance, you like to tell the story about how you, you folks would never play Vampire unless it was night. I can't play. I, I mean, I really couldn't. I, I don't know. Maybe Nikki Maybe Nikki will disagree with me and say she's a, she's been able to play Vampire in the daytime. But I never played that game while the sun was up. Like, it totally just, it did not jive. Um, it did not jive with me mentally to be like, you know, it's, you know, it's the dark streets of Buffalo. And like the summer sun is like streaming yeah. through the window. <laughs> like... I mean, and in the summer, that was kind of hell because we wouldn't start playing till like 10 o'clock at night. Yep. Because it's like, well, it ain't dark. Yeah. It ain't time I, for vampire. I remember doing a, a werewolf session in my apartment um, in the daytime in the living room and sitting around and, and it was just like, you know, it felt weird. Yeah. It's well, like, it's okay to play like, werewolf at day, at, during the day, eh, right? But it's still, it's a world of darkness game, you know? <laughs> It just felt weird. Yeah, see, Nikki's, Nikki said the same thing. Try not to play it during the daytime. It messes with immersion. Like, it's hard to be a vampire and then be like, I mean, the sun's it's outside. Bright. Like, hang on, yeah. I gotta put my sunglasses on. It's getting too bright over It's here. okay, you just play the ghoul game. And that would be different. And then you play the vampire game. That would be fine. Yeah. Like, that would that would be okay. What are your ghouls doing for your vampires during yeah. the day? And then your van- then at now night. Now you get into, like, a kind of Ars Magica kind of thing, right? Yeah. Like, that would be actually pretty cool. Like, yeah. you know, the ghoul phase and the and the... The ghoul phase and the vampire phase. Don't make me design another game right now, please. <laughs> one, don't, don't please do, do it. Do it, man. Do it. Uh, one of these days we'll have to design one together. I think it's going to be L-Hall because I have some ideas. But anyways, uh, another thing to set the atmosphere, how you want to use cell phones at the table is an important <sighs> thing. That's, that's so if you, want, if you want cell phones to be a thing at your table, like we're playing a modern game, so we should be able to text each other. And then you can actually text each other or text the game master like things, whatever. Then that's fine. Or message them in some whichever way, shape or form. Or you want to use it as a research tool. Or, or you can be like, we're just going to not use them at all and put them away. Yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, this gets a little into social contract, but cell phones are definitely a tool that messes with immersion. Um, and if you're playing for pockets of immersion, it's no big deal. You put your phone down and you jump into a scene uh-huh. when it's your turn. But if you're, you know, if you're a group that's trying for continuous immersion, having somebody, you know, hammering away on Twitter, live tweeting the game might jar you out of the, out of immersion. Mm-hmm. So with all of these things, they can give you external cues for becoming immersed in what's going on. Hence the 10 candles thing. It helps you get back into the game quicker after you've interacted with the mechanics. Absolutely. All right. Um, the next one we're going to talk about is mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is what's going on in your head. Because if your mind is cluttered and busy, it's going to be hard to let go and be somebody else. It's true. Um, you know, like if you are, um, you know, if you just came from a shitty day at work and try to sit down right at the table and like, you know, jump into your character, you're going to, you know, still be wrestling and trying to like shake off work. Um, or, you know, you've, had a shitty night's sleep or you know whatever like your mind is your mind is either going to keep you help you get in or it's going to keep you out of immersion um so things that we can do like have socialization time before the game that helps yeah i mean one of those things like tony dave you bob and i i mean we get i mean we're kind of silly when we hang out together yeah and so it helps that we don't immediately sit down to play a game it's true like we have to kind of work Like we eat dinner, then we watch like a couple of like funny videos, tell a couple of funny stories. Then we're like, all right, let's, let's get this going. Uh, Often you, me, Nikki and Bob, we have dinner together. Yeah. It's very nice. Like it's a nice time to just sit and like be ourselves and catch up, Mm -hmm. Um, which is important for me. I think when you listen to the, um, was it this week's pandas game uh, talking about the eight types of fun? Mm -hmm. uh, One of those things for me is that social component. Like my friends are, are my friends are gamers i game with my friends that has really shifted for me in the last couple of years like it used to be not a thing for me like i didn't have to game with my friends but most of since my life is so involved in this all of my friends are in this sphere now right so now you know it's fun to spend time with your friends Uh, yeah of course and then 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 i play games with my friends and then i work with my friends too yeah so kind of awesome like that it is pretty awesome um yeah so socialization um we'll talk about this for keeping immersion but uh note card 
Yeah, because while you're playing, then if you have something that you want to say, just write it down so that way you yes. don't forget it and you've gotten it out of your head. You've talked about this yeah, before. Yeah, you got to just get that. You got to get it out of your head. Otherwise, like, again, you're messing with that mind space. Um, uh, one of the suggestions that came from the G plus community, do another activity that reinforces the theme of the game. So the example was if you're playing, like, let's say we're playing masks, maybe we play um, uh, Sentinels of the Multiverse mm-hmm. uh, before we play masks, right? It's we're playing a superhero themed game and then we're going to go and play our supers game. If you're playing Rockalypse, everybody go find a tune to contribute to a playlist. Yeah. Our heist game set in Vegas. We played poker. Play we poker. did. We played, we played poker and blackjack. Poker. It was great. In fact, that was the opening of our game was we'd all be sitting playing yeah. poker and then we would start talking in character while playing poker. And then yep. that tran- transitions right into your last one, which is the opening ritual. Yeah. The opening ritual. Um, I love this. That poker game was an opening ritual. That that poker game is absolutely an opening ritual. So having an opening ritual, that is something that you do every time to signify the start of the game, um, gives your mind the mental cue that, oh, there's a, there's a line we're shifting out of, we're shifting out of everyday space and we're going into our game space into Mm -hmm. the magic. What is it? The magic sphere? Yeah. Yeah. The magic circle. Magic circle. Thank you. Like we're going into the magic circle. Circle, sphere, one's three dimensional, one's flat, whatever. I, yeah, I mean, why? I mean, why? You know what? Why stop at circle when you can have a whole sphere? It's a stack of circles. Right. It's the integration of a number of circles of varying radii. <laughs> Sorry, go, keep going. Oh, it's my turn. Uh, the next thing is character. So, I actually love this a lot. So, I had an NPC in my second son's game, which was my fourth edition game, that had a gimp arm, and he was like the the patron of the characters, and he was really likable. And uh, he always fed them and he was a, a good guy. But since he had a gimp arm, I would always take my left arm whenever I was playing the character and slide it in to my shirt like so. So they knew when I was that character. Uh-huh. Absolutely. And, yep. and that persisted for like a year and a half. Whenever this character would show up, it would be like this. And then my, he would talk like this. We had um, in our Ebron campaign that um, our friend Mike ran, uh, he had a patron who um, fidgeted with his hat. Mm-hmm. And so the first time Mike played the character, he brought a hat And then he sat and like turned the brim in his hand while talking to us. But from that point on, he never had to bring the hat out again. He would just take his hands and put them up like this and like, like just pantomime turning the hat. And we'd all be like, oh yeah, that guy. Mm -hmm. Right. So I actually really enjoy the idea of acting. Like acting is a thing that I love. Mm -hmm. Like I've always, I want, I I want to do more voice acting. I want to do more stuff like that. I was going to say you like acting, but not so much immersion. Correct. I mean, I do. They're, well, gaming gaming and acting are two different things to me okay. in, in a lot of ways. But even even when I'm gaming, when I get to play characters, there are certain characters that I like to to really get into. Like right now I'm playing um, uh, the prismatic mage. Uh, they call him Sparkles. His name is Jameson Cree. He has a voice. They, I'm sorry. They call him Sparkles? Because he uses, because yes. he's the prismatic mage. He, um, so. No, no. Well, I love it. Yeah. I just love that he's called Sparkles. They, they call him Sparkles. Yeah, no. He doesn't care. Like, it, like that's, that's legit. Because he always, he's using his prestidigitation to constantly make glitter. Sure. So he laces his spells with glitter. Anyways, uh, he, he talks with a bit of an entertainer's bombastic voice. I like it. Um. When I played Call of Cthulhu, I was playing a librarian who talked, he talked like this. His name was Gregory Hines. He had a nasally voice, but I talked like this the entire time I played the mm-hmm. character and they knew it was Gregory speaking because yep. I would stop talking like that and talk like this when I was just being myself. Right. You named a character Gregory Hines. He was actually a part of the Hines family from, you know, the people that make ketchup. I know, but Gregory Hines is like a real dude that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. He Didn't just... care. Okay. Yeah. So that was, a, that was giving, giving your character a voice. I do that. Yeah. You know. So giving a character voice definitely helps. Uh, it does two things, actually. One, it helps you, mm-hmm. right? Because using that voice puts you into the character. It also helps everyone else at the table. Like, because you start speaking in that voice, it, you become atmosphere for everyone else. Like, Korn had a very specific cadence. Yes. Yes, he did. Like, Korn didn't have, like, a, a voice. Korn had a cadence. Yeah, you don't do voices. You do cadences. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very much so. Um, another one. I'll go ahead and give us another one. Um, themed items. So yeah. say you have a specific pen that you use to write notes with your game, or you have a specific notebook that you want for your game or whatever. The sp- give me some other specific items. Um, well, like for instance, um, well, for instance, and this one came from our G plus community. If you're playing a star Wars game, have a star Wars notebook, mm-hmm. right? Because it just kind of reinforces like you're seeing the visual images of star Wars, while you're putting in your, your notes in the notebook. If your dice are themed to the gameplay. Uh, yep. Yeah. If you're, yeah, I mean, some, some games have themed dice that, yep. that, that doesn't hurt. Um, 
Noirlandia, uh, when I backed the Kickstarter, came with a case book. Oh, nice. It's like a, it's just like a small little saddle stitch or saddle stapled book. That's cool. But you actually put some of the clues and write your details. Oh. So I brought mine um, to Dreamation to play in to play in Noirlandia. Like I, I brought it with me. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, and used it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, listen, if you're playing Lasers and Feelings and want, you know, want to break out some plastic tiaras and shit, like, do that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, not Lasers and Feelings. Love and Justice. Love and Justice. Break out your, break out your tiaras. I mean, Love and Justice might as well be Lasers I mean, and if Feelings. Somebody might as well brought, be Rocker Boys if, and Vending Machines. If somebody brought tiaras to the playtest of Love and Justice at Origins... I would I would certainly wear one for playtesting. I would certainly take a picture of them wearing one and post it on the internet. Yeah, I will uh I, I would totally wear um, I mean I would also wear a tiara, so I mean I'm, I'm not really caring. It's yeah, no, I mean I'll own that tiara, man. Like that's it. I'm uh, yeah, that th- yes. Uh the, the another thing that you can do is some sort of detailed background or write yourself some short stories about your character. Things that help you identify. Yeah, you don't have to share all this. No. Like, you could write 12... I mean, we always we always joke about this. Like, don't give the GM 12 pages of background material. Correct. It doesn't mean you don't have to... Ha- like, it doesn't mean you can't have 12 pages of background material. Yeah, and then... Just you- give your GM, like... Like, give to your GM the executive summary of, like, six bullet points that yeah, encompass that. And understand that just because you wrote it down doesn't mean everybody else knows it. So, until you bring it out, right. it doesn't matter. But if, but if, but if reading that background um, just puts you in the you know puts you in that character space uh-huh. do it it's yeah. fine just again don't force your gm to read all Man, of it we are going so long continue on all right um once you've achieved immersion the trick is staying there um immersion is all about maintaining focus and man uh, there are all sorts of things that will break your focus while you're playing yeah there really are so let's talk about some things that break immersion external stimuli we mentioned this a little bit earlier Uh when something outside the game breaks your focus pulling us into the personal level or the real world as we like to say yep so someone comes into the room and starts talking a phone rings the pizza guy knocks or girl knocks on the door wow i haven't done that in a long time mark your bingo pizza folk pizza folk yeah the pizza folk so, I'm totally playing that race next time we play folk. an OSR game. I'm playing the Pizza, pizza Folk. folk? Yeah. That sounds like a good one. I like Pizza Folk. Yeah. Anyways, uh, mitigation. How do we get away from this kind of stuff? How can, how can we prevent this from happening? Yep. So the location is a thing that you can control so that you know no one will bother you. You can always lock the door. And then someone yep. might knock on it then. Um, so that's like access to your area. Things like that. There's a reason why we play close to my kid's bedtime. Yeah. So, they are, so they're are, in bed yeah. while we're playing. Yeah. What's, an, what's the next one? Uh, internal stimuli. Uh, something in your head breaks focus. This is where like some you're sitting there playing and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I got a thing. I got to tell somebody like, oh, man, there was, I saw the stupidest cat meme. I got to share it with you guys. <laughs> um, or, um, oh, we didn't pick out dinner yet. We should totally get pizza. I totally want pizza. I got to tell everybody I want pizza for dinner. Yeah. Just um, write it don't. down. Just write it down. Yep. <laughs> just wait. There'll be a time to share. Mm-hmm. Uh, mechanical issues. When the rules of the game pull us into the game level. So how does grappling work? Right. Well, I mean, there's a half an hour. Uh, there's a whole show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, there, we did a whole show on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely, we did a whole show on grappling. Uh, what are the rules for drowning again? Right. Uh, just put it in your notes, by the way. Yeah. Uh, we need to make a ruling on continuous light on an undead rat. See, I feel like that's a thing, right? I mean, it's undead, so it's not living, right? You could put continuous light on it, right? I mean, I would rule yes. Why not? I roll yes on that one. I'd also have the undead rat bite you and give you some sort of blight. <laughs> sure. A glowing blight. A glowing blight, in yeah. fact. Yeah. So much for the rogue being sneaky. Right. Um, all right, so what do we do to mitigate mechanical issues? Well, Rules Master always helps. Yep. Uh, cheat sheets are also a great thing to oh, do. See, like, that was a show a, topic. See a show a couple, yeah, a couple a little weeks bit ago. ago. Uh, prep the obscure rules and put them in your notes. Yes, please. I've written this so many times in advice. Cut and paste obscure rules that you know are coming up into your prep. GMs, that one is on you. If you're running a game on an icy river... And you have not reviewed the drowning rules. That one is solely on you. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Last thing. Story issues. Um, when something about the story um, causes you to fall out of character, like you are having trouble keeping track of what's happening in the story um, or something. Um, and we just talked about this on, we just recorded this on pandas last night. Um, when the GM makes a mistake and says something wrong about the story and you're like, wait, no, no, it's not Markov. It, it's that was definitely Manford. 
Yeah. Right. Like now you had to stop. Like you just jarred yourself out. I think I've caught this a couple of times happening during the Streets of Avalon recordings. Like from one session of recording to like two sessions later, I'm like, that wasn't the name that we gave that person. Like, oh, we talk about that's coming up next week on Pandas. Oh, it's like man. what happens remember, when you make those mistakes? Well, you remember Amber? Oh, when Findo kept, and Osric? Yeah, Findo and here, Osric. Kendrick throw, and Kincaid. I'm going to throw it this way. Like who cares if it's at your game table? Yeah. Like I am doing this for a podcast. Like, right. What am I supposed to like? That's I, a continuity I, problem yeah, right in the middle right? of your recording. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like <laughs> it's a hell of a lot easier to fix when you're at the table. Yeah. I mean like, Oh, we just made a mistake. Let's retcon that yeah. real quick. So <laughs> some of the examples, like what's that dwarf's name again? Um, I thought you said Markov killed the director. Um, what's going to help with that on the GM side, having some good notes about what happened in a session. If you don't have a good memory of what happened from session to session, like let's say you play every two to three weeks, Having some notes they about help. what happened aren't gonna is gonna help. Uh, player notes. Your players take notes. Yes. I have a stack as Chris as Chris can attest to. I have a stack of index cards that I generate during the course of a campaign where I keep notes about what happened. And more than once before we start a show, before we start a um, game, and this is the last one, pre-game recaps. Um, I consult the cards. Like, what did just happen? And I often ask that question. What happened? Right. Emily is actually really mean about it, and she makes us all roll a d20, and whoever rolls the highest has to recap what happened last time. Oh, that's that's like school rules. I know. It's, I, it's... I used to make the players do it, um, but it's so – it was. I actually wrote an article in Gnome Stew about this years ago. I used to make players do it, and then it's like so excruciating to listen to players try to sum up the game. I'm like, stop. I'll just tell you what happened. Her, her idea is that she wants to hear from a – a player character's point of view. Oh yeah, point of totally. View. I used to do it too, right? Yeah. I want to hear because I want to hear if you picked up all the clues or not or whatever. But then I got to a point where I was like, oh, you guys are so lazy. Like, I'll just tell you, this is what happened. You did this. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's pretty funny sometimes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so are we recapping? Are we recapping? I think we're recapping, right? Are we not there yet? No, there's still a little chunk left. Oh, there is. So this idea of immersion, it's going to break. And when it does, the trick is to address the issue and then return to immersive play, if, if that's what you're looking for, right? Yep. So here are some handy steps to help you get back on track. So address the issue and get it resolved as quickly and uh, efficiently as possible. Yeah. So agree on the pizza, look up the grappling rules, get your brother out of the room, those things. Yep. Uh, then um, let anyone else get things out. Because once you break immersion, everyone else is going to come up for air. Oh, yeah. Right? So you might as well just take a break. And let everybody, like, show Bob the cat meme, um, you know, whatever. Just get go ahead. Get it all out. Yeah, we didn't even talk. I mean, we talked about the character level. We didn't talk about the actual idea of, like, being immersed in the gameplay. No, no, no. No, we were talking about character immersion yeah. tonight. We could have another show to talk about gameplay. I mean, all that stuff kind of applies. Yeah, it's yeah, different so. levels. I mean, just mash this show up with the level one. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Yeah. All right. Um, once you've gotten it out from everyone, center the group. Like, get everyone back to the table. Like, wait for Bob to come back from the bathroom. And then... Um, <laughs> He just flipped me did off. Did he just flip you off? He did. Hey, Bob, do you got to pee? Hans, put the finger he down. Totally this has is to radio. He's totally got to pee, totally right? He totally has to pee. I'm going to nut punch <laughs> both of you guys. We are explicit. You have been warned. <laughs> My sound just went out. Oh, that's too man. funny. Okay. Just happened. Um, anyway, once you're back at the table and everybody's kind of shown their cat meme, center the group, uh -huh. right? Like get everyone like, all right, you guys ready to go back in? All right. Like you guys ready to pick this thing back up? Recap what just happened. Right. Get everyone back. Like, okay. So we were, you know, we were in the room, we were talking to, you know, the count and, uh, let's, you know, let's start off with Chris, um, and then resume play. Mm -hmm. Get going. All right. Let's wrap this sucker up. <laughs> let's wrap this supper up. Sup sucker. Supper. Mr. Mark, Mark word, word scramble. scramble. <laughs> I, I never do them. That's awesome. I finally got one. <laughs> All right. So Thanks, guys. Immersion is a great way to raise your emotional connection to the game and one of the unique forms of this art. Yep. Immersion is a type of flow state where you stay fixed in the character level and it can be continuous or in bursts. By addressing the environment, mind, and character, you can help yourself get immersed. And listen, immersion always breaks. When it does, address the issue, quiet the table, start again. Hmm. Hey, chat room, what's up? The chat room is enjoying the fact that I was going to nut punch you guys. I kind of figured as much. <laughs> well, I mean, I understand. I mean, if you have to go to the bathroom that bad and we're still running the show. So people probably don't know this. Bob is a little susceptible to having to go to the bathroom, especially if you start telling him he has to go. So we often just during a game tell him like during a break, like, oh, Bob, you have to go pee. And yeah. then he's like, 
oh damn it and then like marches off to the bathroom we had a we had a brief detour into running scared territory because of gregory hines do we have to pop explain that i saw a thing where we might I, have to pop I, I did you cover did, it but okay it's good know, not like in super detail it's a it's a fantastic um police action comedy yeah um so good starring um a very young um God, why can't I remember his name? Billy Crystal. Billy Crystal. Thank you, Billy Crystal. And Gregory Hines. And Gregory Hines. Yep. Very funny. Oh, and... Um, Joe Pantoliano. Thank you. Thank yep. you. As Scuzz, right? Snake. Snake. Snake, that's Snake. it. Snake, and he had a multicolor just, mohawk. Just Jimmy push. Smiths, yes. Jimmy, Jimmy Smiths, yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very 80s. Oh, yeah. Uh, very ridiculous. Two cops go to uh, Key West. Mm -hmm. They have a wonderful time in Key West and figure out they should retire, but then they have to come back to Chicago in the in the, win in the winter, of course, oh. and finish out their caseload. Yeah, and not get killed. And they're oh. like trying to be careful when they never used to be careful before. Yeah, they yeah. used to be like they, they used to be like the so best cops. Funny. They used to be the best cops in the precinct because they were super reckless. Yeah, but then they go to Key West and they're like, wait, life is really awesome. We should re they we should retire and open a bar here. And then they're like, yeah, we should get out of being cops. And then they come back and they're like, now we should not get killed. Yep. <laughs> it's funny, man. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that one. Really? Oh, it's really oh, I mean it's so good. It's really good. Billy Crystal. I mean Billy Crystal's I mean Billy Crystal's great, so yes. So uh yeah, uh Rob Whitaker, uh under an assumed name because of one of his accounts he couldn't figure out or something, um, said uh so like ninja player in an NBA game, how does that affect immersion for the other players? Oh well, <laughs> Chris, would you like to talk about um would you like to talk about that for a moment? Not really. I feel like that's baiting. <laughs> so that Here, is let me let me do it I'll, I'll do it anachronistic elements will will interfere with immersion yeah and, and immersion in the game yep because it just it, uh, I mean it was it was actually just one too many things like I could have dealt with one or the other but not both together I mean he's basically playing here a protagonist which is a satirical character not a satirical game yeah and he was carrying around a sword and a map a map scroll case and he was a hacker and he was actually more terrifying for his hacker skills than he was for being a sword far wielding more. Yeah. far more than, than a sword wielding you actually, know, you know guy. what? Actually, the sword never killed me. The hardest part of of um, the hardest part of Dave's character, because I liked Dave's character a lot for other things. The hardest part for Dave's character was that we were playing in um, in Europe, and he had like no languages. He was American, <laughs> and he couldn't yeah. speak another language. Yeah, he, and it was super I, hard I think because he could speak one. He could speak Japanese. Right. It was super hard because it's like, okay, well, this week you're in Italy. Next week you're in Croatia. This week you're in yeah. whatever. And everybody else is like, um, I speak a little Polish or I, you know, speak some Russian or whatever. Yeah, I and spoke it's, like 11 languages or right. something like that. <laughs> yeah, I think was, I had 14. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, you had 14. I had like eight. Yeah. 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 And it was like super hard because it's like Dave doesn't speak any language. So you can't leave him anywhere. Well, it was funny because we were making fun of him by calling him the, the, horse, horse, the horse chopper, chopper in different languages. Languages. And I would actually look up different pronunciations in different languages for horse chopper yes. and make fun of them. Oh God, that was really. Oh no. I mean, <laughs> how'd oh. he die? <laughs> Deceleration trauma? Cement poisoning? Cement poisoning? No, he drowned. <laughs> oh, poor bastard couldn't swim, swim or, or fly. fly. <laughs> <laughs> That's running scared, baby. Oh, Good stuff. Man. I was watching Jeopardy. Uh, so are we moving on? I, we, I think we, we should, should do on. something. I'm going to do this. So it's uh, time for the get healthy section. So Bob, you lost some weight. I dropped three and a half pounds since the last time. Very I'm nice. on this manic friggin' um, um, roller coaster ride where I like two, three pounds up, two, three pounds down, <laughs> two, three pounds up. It's crazy, but I'm on the downside right now. So hopefully that'll continue. So uh, just some some real quick success stories. So Nikki, she's been working out six days a week again. So she's feeling pretty good. Uh, David Walker, he's he's four pounds away from his next goal. So excellent. Oh, excellent. that's fantastic. Yep. Uh, Shorb, Chris Shorb, he's down uh, 1.6. Uh, apparently he was just in Vegas and he walked a ton. So that's always good. I've actually been working out and eating better. I, like, I, I'm actually impressed he was in Vegas and, and lost weight. That is like the land of the unlimited buffet. And no boundaries on when you can eat. Yeah. Like... That's a place where you usually go haywire. So hats off, man. Yeah. Um, but tell you, you've been. Well, yeah, I've been eating a lot healthier. Eli Kurtz, I guess he's been bouldering. That's crazy. What's I love that? it. He's been like bouldering. That's a, it's a workout thing that you can do. With you can, boulders? You basically climb around on boulders and stuff. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of neat. It's rock climbing without ropes on shorter routes. So that's what they are. Okay. Awesome. Dangerous, yep. but okay. 
It's not that dangerous. You could be like that guy who climbed El Capitan. Free, free yeah, I mean, climbed El Capitan I mean, this way. I've done the rock climbing thing too, but um, like I, I got up to a weight that I was not very proud of, and I've been trying to crush it since then, and I'm up down about eight pounds right now. So, I actually forgot to measure my. I forgot to weigh myself this morning because I want to. I had to go out for breakfast instead of in. Um, so I don't quite know where I am. I do know that uh, I am still counting calories. I am uh, walking when I can. And uh, I am meditating. And if I am not losing weight, I am certainly mentally in a better place lately. There yeah, go. there you go. There you go. Uh, Kevin Keneally, he has been a silent participant, but he's uh, down 15 pounds this year so far. Oh, so fantastic. there's a lot of people who are doing a really good job of, of getting the weight off and, doing and getting out there and us. doing things. I mean, I, like I said, I got up to an embarrassing weight that I don't really want to talk about, but I'm down eight pounds. So, so that's good. good. Yep. I mean, down eight pounds for like the last month or yeah. the last mm-hmm. like three weeks since I really started trying to hit at it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you drop eight pounds in one week, you usually have some kind of medical problem. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, you want to check with your doctor. So uh, Jared Rasher, he one he uh, he wrote a very nice review of the Rakshasa's Roost for us. Oh. <laughs> that was kind of him. Thank you, Jared. He also um, threw this thing out here about abstract movement. So these are alternate movement rules for D&D inspired by 13th Age. Uh, the gist of them is, so uh, 13th Age uses, uses a rule set where you are engaged close, near, far. And out of combat. I mean, it's kind of the the, yeah, the range I like, caps. I, I, I like those. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a huge fan of them too. There's a really nice PDF in there. I like. So there's actually been a huge thing. And we're going to do some D and D talk right now, which is weird, but it's it's a rules thing. So, uh, Mike Schle- Mike Shea from Sly Flourish. He's yep. been he's been pimping the theater of the mind stuff super hard lately, and. Uh, talking about that stuff i am actually i like i like theater of the mind but i am really very much more comfortable with relative positioning and that's what these kind of rules are yeah i love this idea of engaged not engaged and you can move around and then how do we adjudicate that kind of stuff right that's why i use that's why like when you're having these these especially D, it's good to have minis or tokens or something on the on the mat so you can everybody can sort of visualize where everybody is so there's less confusion that's why I use it. These rules that he has here are pretty good. They're they're all pretty much just that. Like, can you work? How you can move a range band? You can engage. You can you can you if you have if you double move, you can move two range bands. Uh, it's uh, it's good stuff. I don't know how you guys feel about uh, abstracted movements and things like that. I actually like it a lot. I mean, I I mean I prefer to play without a without a grid or anything. So abstracted abstracted is great for me. Like I I mean because I really just want to know like. Am I close enough to get stabbed by that orc? You know, or am I far enough away to throw the fireball without, you know, without burning everyone else up? <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. We also got a bit of a discussion about hacking games and how some people wonder, some people still um, think that when you hack two systems too much, like it's like we might not, we might, we might not be appreciative of that. Like we don't think that's necessarily the best idea to hack systems too much. Now, I don't, as a, uh, as a reviewer of games, hacking systems is a thing that I'm not interested in than talking about them because that's not the game anymore. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, from a reviewer, from a reviewer standpoint, yeah. Once, once you're hacking the game, you're not really playing that game. anymore. Correct. Now, unless you're talking about how flexible the game is. Uh, if, if hacking the game is one of the qualities of the game. Correct. Yes. Like drifting it, hacking it, whatever you want to call it from a game designer point of view, you should always hack everything. Uh, yeah, because that's how you learn game design. Uh-huh. I mean, so so play a bunch of games, hack a bunch of games, so figure out how can they I, find... Can I clarify what... Because, I, I mean, I'll just clarify because you and I have said this statement before. So the thing is that it's not that we dislike hacking games. The thing that we always say is that if you have hacked a game multiple times for multiple reasons, it's probably not the best fit game. Like, you've made it the best fit game... But you should probably, if you've hacked, like, if you've hacked four systems in a game, you should probably look to see if there's another game that's closer, in a, a closer fit. Yeah, and what's your intention, too? Like, do you just want to play a particular kind of game? Because right. then just go find the game. Stop, right. Save I mean, yourself some work. Because often when you hack something, it means that you don't like what the game is doing. Correct. So, if you, like I said, like, if you've hacked in four subsystems, hacked out four subsystems of the game, like, you might not like this game. That's true. You might like the setting. Uh-huh. more than you like the game. Now, the counter to that, which I think you guys will agree with me, um, is that if you're hacking it because you want to hack it just for, you know, 
the giggles and for for breaking the game apart and 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 yeah, and hacking for the sake of hacking then it's not that you 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 don't like the game that you're playing. I just <laughs> put your hands on the you know, like the head. if you just want to hack it because you want to hack it, then yeah, hack it because you want to hack it. More well, power to you, right? Because you know, you're you're doing it and you're enjoying it, right? And we're not saying yeah. like we're not saying if you hacked out four subsystems of game, you're wrong for playing this game. Go Absolutely. find another one. Yeah. We're saying you could look for another game. Like you might find something that you might not have to hack at all, or maybe you only have to knock out one or two things. I mean, listen, Jason Cordova, one of the biggest fans of dungeon world ever hates one of the subsystems in that game. Oh, uh, which one? The bonds bonds. Yeah, he hates does. Bonds. He hacked bonds. it out. He did. They replaced it with flags, hacked it out, played, he used his flags. They're not a huge um, fan of the perilous journey system either. That's right. Okay they, either well, they I... found a supplement that yeah. kind of covered that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's Okay. The, the the thing is, and I think this was the point you and I were, were trying to make when we when we said that statement a long time ago, um, is that there are many, many games out there. And there's a good chance somebody has designed a game that is going to have a fit that you really like. Um, and so don't hang on to one game and keep trying to hack it unless, of course, that's the yeah. your your specific goal. Play other games like if you have to hack a game a bunch of times, go take a look. Maybe there's another fantasy game that scratches your itch better. And enjoy it. Go enjoy it like somebody, you know, go enjoy that game. But by all means, there's no hard and fast rule to this. If you're having fun, have fun. Yeah, that's, that's the most important thing. I mean, we, we do believe that. We just don't, don't. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, here's the thing. Don't come with a review about a game. With, <laughs> well, if you don't, don't, re- don't, don't review it. Don't review a game that you yeah. hack. No, I mean, here's, <laughs> right. I mean, here's the thing. I like to experience. So m- one of my, one of my things, and, and I like to experience what the designer intended. Yeah. So I don't like to hack games because I'm messing with what the designer's intent was. Mm-hmm. So like I want to go experience the game. Now if I don't like it, I just go play another game. But I'm I'm poly gamers, right? Like I will play a game and be like, yeah, that was great. I'm still gonna go play another game. Like even if I had the best time playing a game within a year, I'm like, I think I want to go play another game now. Yeah. There's been so many times in D and D designs that I've been I've I've seen like people write things and I've done this too, but I know I'm I'm doing it on purpose because I'm referencing other game systems. Yep. That people are doing things and I know that they don't play those other game systems and I'm like, oh, that's the fate thing, and they look at me like I'm stupid or like, what are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, you just re- you just reinvented the wheel when you didn't have to if you just looked at the other thing because you like it's yeah it's cool that you did it. You're not as clever as you think you are. Like, yeah, I mean it's fine. Like you're you're reaching for something that actually already exists in a very supported, um, in a very supported and stable manner. Yeah, and what like it took and, you and what it took you six months to figure out could have taken you ten seconds if you would have just read it. <laughs> yeah, well, if you went, yeah. So I mean, like I am, I am very poly gamer. So I like to try to experience games as is, and then put them down and go do something else. But I have hacked, I have hacked plenty of other games, and it's totally legit. It's fine. A- absolutely, yeah. All right, uh, let's do some Patreon shoutouts before we get out of here. Do, do, do. Remy Billado, Noah Bond, Stacey Winters, Todd Crapper, who was on the show last week, Blaze A. Bear, David Walker, our uh, our get healthy superstar, uh, uh, V, uh, V, uh, V, uh, the Knights of the Night crew, Tom Flanagan, you're in the chat room, so hi, man. How's it going? Hope you're having a good day. I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, Austin Lemke. Who we're going to see next week. Yes. Glenn Sealer, who we saw just a few days ago. Uh-huh. And then Drew Smith, who when I- are we going to see Drew Smith? Well, I play games with him on Monday now, so- well, That's nice. Yeah. Tim Hannon was actually mad at me because he, I, he he's like, why didn't you invite me? I'm like, I invited people if you're in the Slack room, but you're not there. So, I mean, it's not Aww. my fault. It's like you had the invite to the Slack room. Not my fault. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what? Something in the chat room. Sorry. Oh, what, what happened? <laughs> because the chat, we're going to go to the chat room right now. Oh, geez. Oh. Rob Whitaker was like, poo, my feed just dropped. <laughs> and Rob Abrazado <laughs> said, feed, my poo just dropped. Oh, that's funny. And I chuckled because it was law worthy. Yeah, that is lol. Weird. I literally laughed out loud. All right, anything else in the chat room or should we get out of here? I think we can roll on because we were long. Yep, thank you everyone <laughs> so much for listening. If you are free Tuesday evenings, 8.45 p.m. Eastern Time, 6.45 p.m. The Queen's Time, you're welcome. Come join us live on Twitch where you can chat with our other awesome listeners in the kick-ass chat room for life. Kick ass. It is and, quite kick-ass. And ask us questions or let us pop explain things to you during if, the show. If you cannot make it to the live show, check out our podcast each week wherever you get your podcasts. And take a listen to some of the other shows in the Misdirected Mark Network, such as Down with D&D, Threats from Gallifrey, Advantage to Insight, Pandas Talking Game, Cypher Speak with Darcy and Troy, The Gnome Cast, The Streets of Avalon with the Wednesday Evening Podcast, All-Stars, and Hobbs and Friends of the OSR. You can and should also check out some of our brother and sister podcasts. She's a Super Geek, Talking Tabletop, 
the Knights of the Night who are making their triumphant return, mm. and the always amazing Gaming MBS. After you have become fully immersed in the show and want to leave us some feedback, reach us directly through email. Chris at misdirectedmark.com. That's me. Phil at misdirectedmark.com. Sitting across from me. Bob at misdirectedmark.com. At the end of the table. Check out our Facebook group. Hit us up on Twitter at misdirectedmark, at DNA Phil, at Robert M. Everson, at the Light 101. Woo! Or go to the ultimate level of our social media empire, our G Plus community. Very nice. If you like what we do here and on the other shows in the Misdirected Mark Network, you can and should support our Patreon campaign at patreon.com backslash MMP. Patrons get access to the after show, pre-production show notes, musical parodies, the pen is talking games, bonus outtakes, bi-weekly D&D offerings, and other special releases. And with that, this has been a Misdirected Mark production. The media arm of Encoded Designs. Mic drop. We out.